welcome to my talk against me again. So you know that's uh, um, so this talk is a uh, is a extension of um, uh, of the keynote that we gave uh, earlier this morning about um, about a similar topic, right? You know, right one is wrong anywhere. You know, that's uh, um, you know. So the idea is really. Uh, so we are starting to talk with explanation of what are the new challenges that we are facing, and uh, uh, what are the solutions, right? And then we will talk about, uh, we'll give a quick demo about um, running one of our applications inside Docker. That's um, you know, um, and to look forward to the future, where you know, um, when the thing that announced today in the keynote, the, when Docker WebGPU was supported, what what can we look forward to, right? So, yeah. So let's get started. So because um, the title of the talk really is cross GPU or cross platform applications in the cloud. So people say, you know, um, you know, is a, what are the relationship between those two? Is cloud application have to be put, uh, cross platform? And I think the answer is definitely yes. You know, because this is a problem that we thought we have solved many years ago. When I first started, you know, when I got my PhD and first started uh, working in software companies, and that was a time when Java first took off, right? In early 2000s, when Java moved from the browser to the server. And uh, um, the uh, thing that people talk about at that time was to write, write once, run anywhere, you know? So some people think, you know, that's, um, um, it, it's, uh, you know, to go across between different servers and, you know, um, just have the same Java workload to go across different servers. But at the time, it's actually a lot simpler. It's uh, developers all have Windows machine at the time, but the servers are Linux. So if I have my application that's written and compiled on Linux, uh, on Windows, how do I run it on the server, right? You know, that's uh, without cross-platform support for those type of workloads a cloud would never have happened, right? You know, so um, people say there's no cloud, it's just somebody else's computer. That means things that runs on your computer needs to be able to run on that computer. Um, you know, I think 20, 20 some, 25 years ago, Java attempted to solve that problem and we, we thought it has done very well. It's, uh, you know, the, 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 Java byte, the, the Java virtual machine, Java byte code can run all kinds of different CPUs, right? You know, so that sounds like a solved problem and then, you know, um, about 10 years ago, or, or maybe I think 15 years ago now, um, uh, uh, Docker came along and then, you know, um, provide a more elegant solution that doesn't require the Java VM, but provide a more uh, operating system-like solution and solve this problem again, right? You know, so now you have uh, cloud native computing. That is both mostly based on, you know, orchestrating uh, binary artifacts, you know, Kubernetes, for instance, um, it only orchestrates binary artifacts. It doesn't really, uh, it wouldn't recompile for you before it deploy to a node, right? You know, let alone, you know, um, um, changing your source code or changing a different compiler flag to, to do things for you. It's just uh, take your binary and then deploy it to the, um, to the target machine that you specify. And we now call this paradigm the cloud native computing, meaning that's, um, you know, I think the implicit assumption that a lot of people overlook is that you know, the, the workload itself is entirely cross-platform. It is, doesn't matter which machine it runs on. That's why it's called cloud computing, because it can be, it can be moved around just like, you know, um, something in the sky or something in the cloud, right? It's become a utility, and you don't have to worry about those. So those are the, you know, I think the, 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 uh, the promise of cloud-native computing. But then there's this um, slide that we showed at the keynote is that, you know, that's, you know, we saw, we thought we solved the portability problem. We thought that the workload are portable. That's where cloud, that's what it means to be cloud, right? But, you know, um, with Java and then with Docker, we solved, we have the, Java has a CPU level portability or compatibility. Docker has an operating system level compatibility, right? But today we are facing an uh, entirely new set of challenges, you know, so um, not only every single uh, semiconductor companies now have their own GPU or AI accelerator chips that are coming out. Every cloud provider, you know, from Amazon to Google to Azure to Alibaba to Tencent Cloud, they each have their own AI chip, you know, that's proprietary to their own, um, you know, um, 
uh, uh, cloud offerings, right? You know, so uh, we are seeing an uh, explosion of um, uh, AI hardware and drivers. And uh, the old paradigm no longer hold, you know, because now your Java application, you know, it may run on all the CPUs, but, you know, it's, um, you know, the, the Java, if, if your Java application needs to take advantage of, say, the Apple Silicon on the Mac, and then it needs, you know, um, once you compile and, and, and you, you know, you can do that with Java native extension, right? Once you do that, you can, um, you cannot just, uh, take it and uh, same JAR file and run it on the AMD machine or on uh, a video CUDA machine, right? So, you know, so this uh, explosion of uh, uh, GPUs has really broke, I, I, in my opinion, has really broke the, the, the paradigm that uh, cloud computing has been based on, which is all the workloads are cross-platform so that we can orchestrate and uh, manage them as binary artifacts in the cloud, right? You know, so all these new devices, you know, so I think that is a, uh, that is a very big challenge, you know, although I, I know this is an AI conference, but that's, uh, you know, um, um, we are wor working with Linux Foundation, which has, you know, uh, uh, a big presence in, in, um, in, in the cloud computing world, right? You know, with CNCF and all that. And uh, uh, our project, the, the Wasmatch project, those are CNCF project. So, you know, uh, so I think the challenge is very real when we talk about when we talk to people about you know GPU support in uh, you know different cloud providers, right? You know. So one way to solve this problem is to use what they call large language model microservices, you know, meaning to run large language model like a microservice. And how did that work? It works like this. So the current state of large language model application development, both locally and also remotely. Uh, in, in the cloud, right? So we put large language model on its own server called the API server. The API server is also is uh, um, it's conformed to some standard API, like the OpenAI API spec, right? You know, or you know, there's a bunch of spec out there, but the OpenAI spec maybe is the most popular. So you know, so you have a large language model runtime that encapsulates the large language model, and it offers services as APIs to the rest of the applications. So this API server is then loaded into your real application as a sidecar service, right? So if you are familiar with service mesh and you know um, a microservices jargons, is that you know there is a fairly stable um, application that runs its own containers or its own hardware, and then it offers a HTTP service or a gRPC service to the rest of applications, rest of microservices in your network, right? You know, so then your application itself can be written in, say, Python, you know, that's, uh, so there's lots of choices here. So once you have the um, large language model or the AI service itself running as a, as a separate application, uh, as a separate server, that's, uh, th that function as a sidecar, then your, um, uh, your microservices or application can use, say, you can use Langchain to manage the prompts and workflows, you know, how do you coordinate, how do you, you know, um, get response from the, from the large language model server and then update it and then send another request in there, right? You know, so you can use Langchain to, to, uh, to manage a lot of those. And you can use Llama Index to build a data, uh, uh, to build a knowledge pipeline that take from the PDF or images and, you know, things like that and generate a vector database where you can then use, um, you know, as a, um, a, a you know, um, you know, so the application could query the vector database first, and then get the context, and then use Langchain to to um, to access the the um, the LM API server that's running in the sidecar, right? So you can have Stimulet for front-end UI applications. You can have a lot of no no-code tools that integrate this way. You know, like uh, uh, Open Web UI, Flowwise, DeFi, and you know things like that. You know, those are um, you know no-code tools where you can configure them to say, I want to use the Open AI API. I want to use Open uh, api.openai.com, uh, or I want to use my own, um, you know, LIM API server that's running in my own cloud, in, in my own cluster, right? You know, so it'd be my own IP, IP address and all that stuff, right? So this has worked so far, you know, it's, uh, uh, um, if you see um, uh, uh, large language model applications or AI applications in general, uh, the vast majority of them are built this way, okay? So, you know, um, it's great for research and experimentation, you know, say if you want to, uh, uh, agent that can write a program for you, or you know, you have a personal assistant or whatever, right? You know, you need to experiment with a lot of the, you know ways to do your 
um, um, how to manage your, your, your rack database, how to manage your prompt, and you know, things like that. So this is good. You know, that's, uh, um, this um, sort of get around the portability problem by putting the LM or the, or the, or the feature that re really requires GPU on a separate hardware, you know, on a separate server. That separate server is sort of isolated from the rest of your cloud, cloud native infrastructure. So you know, so you are accessing that as if it's OpenAI or as if someone else manages it, right? You know, so you know it's uh, so on those servers you could have custom built runtimes and you know different models and all that stuff. But then your cloud application is still running in Python in in containers and you know things like that. So that's the current status of that. But of course, the challenges are also very interesting, you know, because the first. Deploying and managing those API servers on GPUs is not easy anyway, you know, because, you know, um, while we have isolated this problem into uh, its own microservice, but, you know, uh, to deploy those services on, you know, because as G the number of GPUs or the number of workloads goes up and the, the, the need to manage those APIs in, in a more stable fashion, you still need Kubernetes and tools like that that only deals with binary artifacts, right? You know, so. Those, to manage those API servers on GPUs is not easy anyway. And the second is that um, the interaction between, because the sidecar service provide most likely a JSON or HTTP service. So to access HTTP APIs is another challenge because you know, um, HTTP is unstructured, is fragile, you know, that's, uh, you could mistype, misspell, and uh, uh, you know, it's unsecure because you know, um, in your own network, you typically do not have HTTPS. If you, um, if you do, there's a huge performance impact. So there's lots of issues with unstructured HTTP APIs. It's weakly typed or it's untyped at all. So it's depend on the, uh, the client and, and the server to, gen, uh, to agree upon certain, certain protocols, right? You know, so that's another fragile uh, um, uh, link that you are introducing into your application. But perhaps more important is that it's often difficult to separate the middleware from the LIM. What does that mean? That means, you know, we are talking about using LangChain to, to manage the prompt, using Llama index to manage the Rack database, and then have the large language model running in its own server, right? However, the, what type, what prompt do you use for what model is highly interlinked? You know, so some prompt works on ChatGPT, but doesn't work on Llama 3. And uh, the prompt that works on a smaller model probably doesn't work on a larger model and vice versa. So there's tight coupling between your application and the large language model API server that you stand up. So that sort of breaks uh, the sidecar paradigm because the sidecar paradigm is really, those two can be separated and you can link them through the API, right? So, you know, as soon as you have tight coupling between the middleware and the large, uh, the, the LM server, it becomes a lot, lot more difficult to architect your application, stable application this way, because you could find that you change one component on your end, change the prompt in LangChain, and suddenly the, or change, update the language mo model from Llama 2 to Llama 3, things would not work because the, um, because uh, the prompt on the LangChain side suddenly didn't work. And because the Llama 3 has longer contact lengths than Llama 2, so you would find the, um, the vector database that you prepared in the past may not uh, may not be able to fully take advantage of the longer context window. So you would have a lot of issue like that, that indicate tight coupling between the middleware and the, uh, the large language model. And uh, within that scope, it becomes increasingly difficult to have the large language model running on its own containers, on its own hardware, and then have the application sitting next to it, right? So, um, of course, then the API server itself themselves are fast evolving because there's constantly new models, new APIs, new versions of existing models that does things differently, right? You know, so it's, uh, it's in general, I think it's, uh, uh, like I said in, in the previous slide, it's great for, um, you know, for, uh, for research and prototyping purposes, but for uh, stable production use, if you really treat this like a sidecar API, I think there's lots of challenges. So I want to say perhaps a better way is the return of the monolithic applications, you know, so I think, you know, huh? what did it, uh, because no, okay. M maybe the monitor didn't like that tweet, right? You know, so that tweet at the time was very, very controversial, you know, so, um, uh, uh, basically he said things that are, 
uh, at the time, you know, uh, that was uh, almost two years ago, I think. You know, uh, at the time, was believed as a gospel in the, in the cloud native space that nobody is willing to question. But um, you know, he basically said, you know, 80% of the microservices are waste. He can turn off all those. And uh, two years later, when we look at how uh, X.com or Twitter was performing, you know, we think that it wasn't a big deal. You know, turning off those microservices wasn't a big deal. There's companies that I work with, you know, that's uh, um, large internet companies that grew up in the, uh, in the cloud native and the microservices space that uh, have extensive use of those, uh, the sidecar pattern I just described. Uh, within that company, there's 50,000 microservices. I'm not talking about 50,000 machines. They have a lot more machines. They have 50,000 separate services, meaning that 50,000 teams that's hundreds of thousands of employees that build those services and then deploy those services. And uh, you, would think, you, would, uh, you would see that managing those microservices becomes very, um, it's very difficult challenges. That's why in the cloud native space, now you see um, microservices orchestration frameworks where you can bundle commonly used microservices into one Docker container and then you know, have them run together. You know, although they were, de uh, they were developed and deployed as five different services, but now at deploy time, you, you, you reintegrate and combine them together because it's just too much, uh, too wasteful and too unstable to deploy them one by one as, uh, as independent services, right? So there's a, there's a return for building uh, monolithic applications. And I think the, the wide use of large language model would accelerate this trend, you know, by, um, you know, um, by, by coming back from the, from the mode where every single small function become a microservice, every small function become a sidecar, and goes back to the um, earlier vision of uh, vertically integrated application. You know, those three-tier Java applications, you know, where you have the front-end middleware and database, they all live in, uh, you know, they all live on the same server. You know, that's, uh, um, so we really think that's a large language model perhaps would replace the database tier in that architecture. That so you would have applications that provide application level services, but with large language model embedded in them, instead of large language models sitting beside them as a sidecar, right? You know, because sitting beside them as a sidecar, you have the, all the problems that I mentioned because of the tight coupling between the application and the large language model itself make it really difficult to make the, the sidecar model stable. But if you have a large language model that's integrated into the application itself, they are updated together. Every time you release a new version of the large language model, you must release a new version of the application because they are bundled in the same container. You know, that would make it a lot easier to test and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, you know, uh, uh, for the developers who maintain this would know that if I update the model that I would have to update the prompt as well. Instead of, you know, I just, I'm just uh, updating an API server that I, I don't care who's, who's, uh, what kind of prompt or what kind of middleware is interacting with my large language model, right? So I think there's a the better way, or at least in my opinion, I think, you know, um, people are, um, uh, at least from my observation, people are clearly moving toward that direction, is to have the large language model embedded into their own application that's in the same container, right? You know, that's, uh, um, so that brings up the old challenge again. So, you know, the, so the way we put large language model in its own hardware and become, make them become their own API server is because we want to mitigate the problem of having to deploy them on different GPUs, right? But with vertically integrated applications now, we have that requires us to do cross-platform applications all over again, because now we have um, the, the, um, the LM capabilities that are embedded into the application, meaning that the application itself would have to deal with GPU compatibility again. You know, so it's unlike today's launch chain application or Lama index application, where you only need to deal with Python compatibility and Python portability, you know, and you don't need to deal with uh, real GPU portability because GPU components running on another machine. Now you are all running in your container, so you would have to do, you, know, you would have to go back and take care of those again. So cross-platform compatibility becomes, I think, the number one hurdle of this monolithic approach. That that's uh, that's that people want to take, right? You know, so you, so that's um, it's a long winded way, you know, um, to say that's that's the work that we have um, that's that we have done so far in the cloud native space is really try to 
um, solve this fundamental problem is not to get a workaround, you know, to get a workaround and say, you know, um, it's, it's uh, okay, we can't solve the GPU portability problem, so why don't you just isolate all the GPU portability problems into its own separate API server and have someone else, someone else worry about it and move it outside of your Kubernetes cluster, right? You know, we want to, um, from the, the bottom of the stack, to have a new solution that provides portability for applications that build on top of large language models, right? So the goals are actually very easy. So what I call those goals, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, the, I think time is just a flat circle. You know, things, um, all the old things become new again, right? You know, because those two goals are exactly the goals when Java came out. People who use Java said, that's our goal, you know, is that there are two things. Developers must be able to compile and test on one machine and deploy on another machine. You know, they, you can't let, uh, ask them to say, rewrite your code. You know, now this code runs on the, the Mac with the Metal framework or whatever. Now, rewrite this code, recompile this code, and deploy it on video machine on Linux, right? You know, you cannot ask them to do that because developers, um, you know, um, through the success of Java, you know, we, well, we have seen that developers would never do that, right? And then the application itself has to be able to move it around and deploy it to new hardware by Kubernetes by um, you know, existing frameworks that, uh, that manage binary artifacts only, right? So those are, I think those are two simple goals that makes uh, uh, those applications cloud-native. You know, what makes the application cloud-native? It's those two features, you know, in my opinion. You know, so that's, uh, um, you know, so when people ask me, you know, that's, um, people always ask this question. You know, what's the difference between WebAssembly and Java? They seem like the same, you know, that's, uh, you know, solving, Similar problems in the browser and on the server as well. You know, my my goal is my, my answer is really you know WebAssembly is the new Java, but for GPUs. That's uh, it's not a, a, a you know I think uh, uh, some people might disagree with that. You know because that's how um, many people that's not how many people in the in the WebAssembly community see themselves. But you know that's um, um, as one of the uh, leading WebAssembly runtime. You know that's where. Um, what the Edge sees most of these applications today, right? You know, is that to use WebAssembly as a portability layer to run applications on the GPU, right? And uh, the way to do that, and, and the reason to do that is to have to have the GPU component embedded into the application. You know, that's a better architecture. That's a easier, that's something that's easier to manage, right? So those are the goals. And uh, uh, within, with those goals, we have several dimensions, you know, that's, uh, that we can do with, with um, w um, you know, that's we have to achieve, right? So first, we have to achieve GPU portability. We talked about that already. So we have GPUs, TPUs, MPUs, you know, there's lots of, you know, um, specialized hardware. And each of them have a driver. And a lot of GPUs have more than one driver, right? You know, that's, uh, so NVIDIA has CUDA 1, uh, CUDA 11, CUDA 12, different version of CUDA, has CUDA and has uh, Tensor RT, has all kinds of stuff. Each of them are fit for different models, you know, that's the, the, the cross-platform compatibility framework has to support all of those. So it has to be, have GPU compatibility portability first. And the second dimension is runtime portability. What does that mean? It means there's uh, applications, uh, um, you know, uh, model-specific runtimes that build on top of the drivers. So for instance, on Intel CPUs, we have um, if we want to run a large language model on the Intel CPU, we have things like OpenVINO or Lambda CPP or Intel NeuroSpeed. Each of them different. For instance, the new Intel NeuroSpeed takes advantage of the AMX and AVX features in the latest Intel CPU. So it can run a lot faster on the CPU than say Lambda CPP, which is um, use generic CPU architecture and then use the um, you know, um, uh, uh, use available GPUs, right? So, you know, um, so if you only have the latest Intel CPUs, if you have the uh, Lama 3 model running on neural speed and uh, running on Lama CPP, you could see a performance difference of 10 times or more, right? So the, the neural speed that come from Intel runs a lot faster on their own hard on their own hardware, right? So, you know, NVIDIA GPU has the same problem in Mac, you know, there's metal framework, there's MX, you know, so there's GPU runtimes. And then there's model runtimes, even for the similar model, you know, so for Llama 3 or, you know, LLM, you could have Llama.cpp, you could have Kendall, you could have Burn, you could have a lot of runtimes. You could have LLM.c, right? You know, that's, uh, so, you know, so there's lots of um, um, uh, model runtimes. Those model runtimes, 
does processing that um, specific to the models. For instance, it does uh, encoding, decoding, does uh, um, you know tokenization, and uh, it turns uh, whatever data that makes sense to you. It's a language or it's an image, and turn that into uh, a vector array, and then have the model process it, and come out another vector array and translate that into the into the model uh, in, into something human can understand as well. So the the portability means. If I write an application, I shouldn't be worried about what is underlying runtime. So if I write an application, it can run on open YNO. It should also be able to run on Lama.cpp. It also should be run on neural speed without me changing a line of code, without me even having to recompile every, anything. Right? So meaning that the binary artifact should be agnostic to all the runtimes underneath it. You know, that's a, that's the second goal. You know, that's a, uh, if we want to have true portability, we need to not only just any hardware, but any software runtime on top of the hardware. And we also need model portability, meaning if you look, because this type of thing is happening, run, um, uh, is moving very fast. If you look at project like Lama.cpp, they are having three to four releases per day, every day. And every release breaks something and fix something, you know, so it is crucial that when you have a model that's, um, that you know it's going to work with certain version of Lama.cpp. You freeze that, and uh, then have that information available at runtime, so that you only use that with uh, with um, only use that model with that runtime. By the way, that is also why we can't uh, the sidecar model is so broken. It's because the sidecar model fix you at one of the runtime versions, and then that it then it can only handle the model that's that are specifically tied to that version, right? But with the uh, embedded LM. You can um, you can have your own. You would be able to have your own specification in terms of what is the version of the runtime and what is the version of the model. So we can't have things like you know, um, it's uh, the application works today, but uh, a couple months later, you know, when there's a new model that's released or a new Python module that's released, then the application suddenly doesn't work, right? You know, because the um, you know the tokenization uh, step has one more extra space in the in the new model or whatever right you know so so the model portability is another dimension where you know when we need truly um, portable applications we need one single binary that is going to be able to work with the model that that when uh, at the time developed developed and tested and then it should be working with that model forever you know that's uh, so that's what we call model portability and then obviously there's container portability meaning that we need to um in today's um you, uh, most container setups you need to carefully match container image with the host and the shim that comes with the container image you know so if you want to um inside the container image you use cuda 11 for instance then the underneath Underlying runtime has to have the NVIDIA toolkit for um, CUDA 11 installed, and then the host has to have the appropriate drivers installed, right? You know that's uh, all have to match in order for them to uh, in order for them to work, right? So what we want um, uh, the way to solve this problem is really to have uh, standard abstraction in containers. So, oh, so I'm. I think I'm um, running really short on time. You know, I, so, so, sorry, I, I ramble down. But but that's uh, but those are the most important issues that we have. So that brings to the topic that WasmH is a lightweight and a portable AI and LM runtime. You know, that's we um, you know this um, it's a middle tier. That's um, let me show you. So how it works is that it's agnostic to programming languages. So you have different programming languages, and you just need to write toward the same. A standard set of APIs. It's called Wasi NN. And once you compile this application, Wasi into the Wasi binary for developers, it's done, right? You know, because the runtime at runtime figures out which, um, you know, is it running on top of Lama.cpp or is it running on top of New York Speed? And then it knows from goes from the uh, the Wasi NN API how to dispatch to the underlying runtime and actually made it work right. You know, so so it's a uh, so for developers it's a it's a it's a very easy process. You know you just write to this API and then you compile to Wasm, and then you can package the Wasm application with the runtime versions and all that with the model versions into a Docker image. That's um, you know so to achieve what I have just described, you, know, you have a monolithic application that has an embedded runtime and an embedded large language model, and the embedded runtime separates out, allows this whole thing to run on different 
um, hardware and on you know uh, on web GPU inside Docker on um, you know Nvidia hardware when you know it's the, the appropriate shim is installed on Docker and you know things like that. So that's how it works. And uh, I. I'll go over that. You know, that's uh, you know uh, the the Wasi N API is actually very simple. You know, so this is uh, um, you know I was joking. I was telling people that I can fit the whole large language model inference uh, code in a, in a in a in a single slide. That is that single slide. You know, so that's uh, where you know uh, this goes through the whole process of you know uh, loading the model, setting up the context, do the tokenization, and then it's done. You know, that's so it's uh, um, it's all written in Rust, by the way. So it uses the uh, Wasi API for Rust. You compile that to Wasm, and that's it. You know, that's uh, you you can take the application anywhere. That's um, inside Docker and outside uh, uh, and outside of it, and uh, and. And have it run uh, on, on the Wasm. So I don't think I have time for the demo, but uh, you know, if you, so, yeah, okay. So well, so um, everything I talked about today is open source. You know, so there's uh, um, uh, there's this Wasm Edge runtime, which is um, uh, WebAssembly runtime we talked about, and then the Llama Edge is uh, on, um, you know AI libraries that build on top of Wasm Edge. So meaning that makes um, use Wasm Edge to interact with large language model and other AI models like YOLO, Vision, you know, like uh, Whisper, like, uh, you know, there's, uh, so there's, um, you know, there's a, a large li library of models that, uh, you know, uh, you, you can already work with using, using, um, using the, um, using Wasm Edge, right? And then there's, um, you know, um, one of our downstream customers called Gaianet, and they have a, they, they have a, why we keep demoing them is that they have a great example of vertically integrated application because they have a whole, they have a single container that has the the the, the rag element, the vector database, the the Wasm runtime, the large language model has all of them together, and they all are tightly coupled so that when you change one thing, you need to change all the other things to make it work optimally instead of having them as four separate containers, and then you know then. You change one of them, the other thing still sort of works, but it doesn't work very well, right? You know, so it's, uh, you know, so that's really reflect our thesis or reflect our thinking that uh, uh, in the large language model space, you know, a lot of those um, uh, microservices really need to be combined together and become more tightly coupled. So that's, uh, but that's it. Yeah, thank, um, thank you very much. I, I'm sorry I, I went long and uh, didn't have time for the demo, but, you know, that's, uh, but hopefully this is useful. Yeah, thank you.